Hello, welcome to the Babbage podcast. I'm Alok Jha, science editor at The Economist. And I'm Ainsley Johnston, a data journalist and science correspondent. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about collecting rare seeds and why it's so important to maintain biodiversity. So you were in Madagascar to collect seeds. And I think it's just worth explaining why the scientists that you were with there want to collect seeds from Madagascar's forest in the first place. It's all part of a huge long-term project to track biodiversity from around the world, run by the scientists at Kew Gardens in Britain. Just tell us about the seed bank that those scientists have put together. The Millennium Seed Bank, which is based in Wakehurst in southern England, is managed by the Royal Botanical Gardens, Kew. And that is the biggest seed bank in the world, the biggest repository of wild plants anywhere. And their goal is to try and bank as many seeds as they can from as many different species with the goal of conservation and um, preservation and even restoration of of the world's uh, wild landscapes. So you were there on a trip to collect a whole range of seeds, which will, which will be um, some of which will be stored in Madagascar, but sort of some, some of which came back to the UK as well. So just take us take us to the country. What is it like to sort of accompany these botanists going around collecting seeds? And when you think of botanists, you think of laboratories or people growing plants in greenhouses. You don't think of them driving around jungles doing Indiana Jones stuff. Thinking about the idea of seed collecting before I went, I had this idea. What did you imagine? I don't know. I think I imagined it was very sedate. You would just be sort of ambling around, you know, plant stores. Oh, there's a seed. Let's pick it up. (laughs) Yeah. How hard can it be? You would sort of pick one up. You put it in your bag. What I didn't realize was, I mean, so many things. One, how many seeds they have to collect. Two, how difficult it is to reach the seeds, to find the seeds, to get there at the right time. Um... And three, I think also kind of how dangerous it is and how um, how much risk there is. And these scientists are really, you know, they're doing something pretty amazing. What's a, what does a seed hunting expedition look like? Well, I actually went along on one. It all started in Antananarivo, which is Madagascar's capital. From there, we set off in their four by four, which is what they take on a lot of their expeditions, off to this forest, which is about 140 kilometers. And we drove several hours uh, to the east. It used to be the case that the entire east coast of Madagascar was filled with this humid forest, a rainforest effectively. But what has happened is over time, a lot of that rainforest has been lost. It's become really fragmented. The part that we went to was relatively intact. It was part of a protected area, which was set up by some local people in around 2006. Um, and it's a place where they go often um, to look for seeds, but also to do training. Does, what does the actual process of getting there feel like? Yeah, so this journey, I think, was extremely easy by their normal standards. So luckily, from Antananarivo down towards the East Coast, there is actually a pretty good road. Um, there's a port on the East Coast, and so a lot of lorries were going up and down this road. Traffic can just pass <laughs> each other coming back and forward there are these huge trucks driving along it and it was just full of potholes the entire way it was also exceptionally windy there were these hairpin bends that were just so incredibly steep but yeah when i spoke to the scientists they said this is really this is really easy they're they're probably used to driving those roads and can do the hairpin bends at some speed right yeah they are very used to it um some of the places where they go to do collections are three or four days of driving away huge parts of Madagascar are not connected by proper roads. So it's driving off road large parts of the way. On this trip, we were able to drive on the main road most of the way. And then we went off onto a forest track, which we stayed on for maybe about 15 kilometers. But there are some places where they go collecting where they've got to hike for for days on foot. And then while they're doing their collecting missions, they can last up to two weeks. So that means they're hiking for multiple days, carrying all of their food and equipment for two weeks, which is just crazy. I mean, that's that's that's, again, one level beyond the normal botany that people might be expecting if they're sort of even enthusiastic gardeners. Right. If if, if you're collecting and understanding plants that way. So this is what you have to do to get to the rarest plants, to understand biodiversity, to sort of maintain it and all of that. Some of these places that they're going to are so remote and, you know, there are crocodiles, there are dangerous rivers. There are ravines. Were you wandering around places where potentially a crocodile might have just wandered past you? (laughs) 
There were no crocodiles that I saw. <laughs> when we were driving up to through the protected area to the place where we finally stopped to, to walk around and to have a look for the seeds, we would drive across these bridges that were just made of pieces of timber. And we were in this huge four by four. And yeah, there were points where I've got to say I was a little bit nervous as we <laughs> drove over this very rickety looking bridge. We can laugh about it now. But obviously in the moment, I'm sure it was quite it's quite difficult. Um, when you get to these places, when you when you finally, you know, you've driven all this way, you've met the local guides, you've walked past the crocodiles and you've got to the plants that you want to that they want to collect seeds from just take me through the process what does it mean to collect a seed um, I, I, I imagine it's more than just picking up some stuff and putting it into an envelope yeah wow it is a lot more than just picking up some stuff and putting it into an envelope uh, so there's multiple stages so the first thing when they get to a forest let's say uh, they spot a tree that is one of their target species and I at first thought, oh, that would mean great. Then collecting begins. But the first thing they have to do is they have to um, sort of map the population. So they'll go around the entire area and they will count up how many um, of these trees that they see. And that's really important because for each sample that they take, they want it to have a relatively constant gene pool. So they want to collect from all of these um, trees that are in a sort of similar area that are likely to sort of share genetic information. And then what they'll also do is if they find another population somewhere else, they'll collect from that as well. So that's stage one is to sort of assess the population. Stage two is to find ripe fruit. So they can only collect seeds when the fruit is ripe, which is easier said than done for multiple reasons. Well, first of all, it restricts the amount of time you can go and find them, right? You can't just decide to spend, you know, all summer looking for something or whatever. You've got to know exactly when to get there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they keep great records of when all of the different trees in Madagascar fruit. But one problem that they mentioned that they've been facing is that with climate change, a lot of these fruiting times have changed. And it there was a, a period of time where they were finding it very hard to predict when trees would, would be ripe. So they would, you know, travel to one of these places, one of these huge epic journeys. They would get there and they would find, oh, all of the fruit is gone, is gone. And that would be it. So when, when, you, when these scientists do collect the seeds, though, they're all taken back to the capital city and to the facility there. What happens to them there? Yeah, so uh, what they'll do is they'll collect all of their seeds, take them back to Antananarivo. And once they get there, they will be uh, cleaned. So remove all of the bits of um, fruit or, you know, pulp or whatever else is surrounding the seeds. And that's actually a big, big job, really. Um, they will take a small sample of them and they'll test them for germination. So the idea here is they just need to check that these seeds will actually produce a plant because there's just no point in, you know, doing all this work to prepare these seeds, to store them in the seed bank, and then they can't actually produce a plant. So, yeah, they'll do this germination test and then they will dry out the seeds. And then what they'll do is half of them will be stored in the seed bank in Antananarivo. How long does this process take, roughly? It takes a few weeks, I think, normally. I mean, yeah, a few weeks to do the germination test and also to dry out the seeds as well. Um, they have special rooms that to do this drying, really dry, as you imagine. <laughs> um and yeah, it, it just takes a little while to, to sort of um, test that they're actually going to produce. OK, so half the seeds stay there in that facility? Half the seeds stay in the seed bank in Antananarivo and half of them will be sent to uh, the Millennium Seed Bank in Wakehurst. You talked about how the forests on the East Coast are have been really degraded for all sorts of reasons. For climate change, invasive species, uh, too much exploitation, etc. How much of a difference to that sort of place could a seed bank really make? So there is a lot of um, conservation work or, or uh, restoration work, I should really say, going on in Madagascar. So um, the government and NGOs are taking seeds out of the Malagasy seed bank all the time to, to try and do this restoration. And Q itself have big restoration projects as well. So in one national park, Ankorafantisk, which is a dry forest in the north of the country, They've planted around 30,000 seedlings um, as part of a big uh, forest restoration effort. That's not a humid forest, um, so that's a bit easier to use the seed bank seeds there. Um, but yeah, I mean, th there, there's a lot of this work going on there. Um, 
but it's yeah against a kind of difficult background of of the forest still being cleared. The other difficult background we should mention, I suppose, is that in recent weeks there's been a military coup in Madagascar. This happened after you, your trip. Has that had an impact on the work that the scientists and and local community agents are doing? Yeah, so I spoke with some of the scientists during the protests. They were a little bit disrupted, but he says it's back to business as usual now. I think it remains to be seen whether sort of funding will be the same as it was before in terms of the sort of um, Malagasy government's work in, in restoration, but it shouldn't affect the Q scientists that much. Sounds promising, at least for now. Um, it sounds like seed banks, though, are something a bit underappreciated, you know, and, and they're going to get more important as climate change changes the way that forests grow, as more people exploit their, their local ecology and everything. I just wonder, will it make a difference to Madagascar? Is it too early to say? I think the problem is that um, the forest is just being cut down at a rate that, you know, just the Q scientists are never going to be able to match that. Um, and it's being cut down in different places that, you know, are, are not necessarily the places where their work is, is going to be the most useful, or the most um, effective. I think part of the problem there is just incredible poverty in the country. Um, and that is really why so many people are are sort of driven to cut down their natural resources and, and over exploit them. Um, I guess one thing that may help that in the, in the future is just if, if, if that situation can improve. Ainsley, that was really incredible. Thank you so much for bringing that story to us. Thanks for having me.